I'm here talking to the artist Robbie Cook. Um, could you just introduce yourself and say where you're from and maybe when you started uh, painting? My name is Robert uh, Cook. Also I'm known as Norot. Uh, it's kind of the name I've been going by professionally for the past three years uh, with the project and the name is kind of synonymous I guess uh, with my music project and our project because it's kind of a, a cohesive whole. Uh, it's all meant to reflect uh, a similar uh, concept overall of uh, visual and sonic art uh, and, uh, and how they, 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 they all relate to each other. So I've been doing this, uh, uh, well, art since as long as I can remember, but professionally, on a professional level, just for myself, I've only been doing it for the past three years. Uh, before that, um, I've worked in architecture for several years and uh, being a graphic artist, you know, working for other people and never really taking time to, to expand and do it for myself. And um, with all my music projects and all the bands I was in throughout since the 90s, I was always doing the artwork and uh, for the bands, flyers, T-shirts, whatever. And um, the artwork started becoming kind of very prominent uh, again in my life. Uh, and when I started getting offers to do commissions, um, for album covers for various bands and so forth and didn't take it very seriously at first and, and uh, it's kind of a hobby and, and um, as uh, the, as I'm, the time went on in, in my time in Ireland actually it was it's probably the most important point to make uh, living in Ireland it was I was given the amount of time to really focus uh, and separate myself from influences back home. Um, it, kind of a, a bit of an isolation for me because it was kind of removing myself from everything that was comfortable. So when I came here, I, I kind of was like a completely new creative beginning for me. So this concept was kind of born out of that. And uh, that opportunity uh, is, was priceless for me. And, and, uh, and eventually I, I started working in the occult publishing and doing book covers, uh, illustrations for several occult publications, and, and also still maintaining uh, many clients in the music scene as, and using actually my music as a vehicle to, you know, to show examples of my work and what I can do. And it and actually it, it reaches other bands and other artists and it's 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 been so far very uh, rewarding bearing much fruit for me lately so it, things things are going well uh, I said painting it's more it's more drawing uh, yeah 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 um, I do some painting uh, I it's kind of a hybrid technique uh, sometimes I just splash watercolor on a piece of paper and come up with an interesting shape and something I do some pen and ink illustrations over it and that's about as far as my painting goes most of my artwork is very intricate um, ink work and that's obviously my influence of growing up in, uh, with architecture as a main focus my dad all my life was one of the best draftsmen I've ever known uh, just his hand drawn work was in line work was a exceptional and and uh, it's always encouraged me and when I when I went to school for it uh, I was lucky enough I was kind of at the edge of when the digital technology was kind of becoming uh, taking the lead uh, with, the, with the drawing and, and so forth and I, I was allowed the opportunity to study both at the same time. Uh, it was a lot of people now going into school, uh, especially in the architecture field, maybe they may not get the opportunity, or at least in the drafting field, to, to experience what it's like to actually draw with pens and to know that that feeling, that organic feel of it. Everything is pretty much done now with through CAD systems, and I, I was I was lucky enough to kind of catch the tail end of that that dying culture. And uh, working in architecture, I worked with architects of several generations. Some still drew by hand, and uh, and I was able to do both, which was a big advantage for me. Also, 
I embraced the digital technology for years and years, and I, I, went, I got to a point where I completely rejected hand illustrations and, and organic side of art, and I just did predominantly this Photoshop-based type art and 3D animation. I really got immersed in that, you know, I'd say like 10, 11 years ago, and uh, but it, it, it's something that just felt a little cold about it, and I just really wasn't achieving what I wanted to, to achieve, and uh, so I really wanted to get back focused on a more organic way of creating art, and and just I remember my education, my art education, my whole life, uh, so many art classes and art courses, and and uh, then the the drafting influence, and I just kind of merged all that into one thing. And, but painting is something I'm going to explore further in the next few years. Uh, I've done a few paintings here. And even one one of my most popular ones is actually painted with my own blood. And Why did you use blood? Uh, it, it, for me, it was just like a personal symbol, some personal symbolism in it. Uh, I, I really, uh, it will probably take so long to explain, uh, but... Um, this is a lot of magical. Yeah, yeah, it's some intent. It was like a sigil uh, uh, process for me, a very complex form of a sigil, like a personal symbolism. And it was important to use my blood in that uh, just as long as it stays in my hands. <laughs> I believe it, it holds some power for me. Um, and and uh, it, is, it was a popular piece. Uh, when I posted it for the first time, you know, a lot of people really liked it. I think they appreciate the, the symbolism of the personal sacrifice. Uh, basically, I think a lot of the theme of it was sacrifice, uh, like a personal sacrifice. And uh, when something's given that's very personal that causes <laughs> you to be kind of uncomfortable or uh, emotionally distressed even, you know, to give up something that's very important, that's a true sacrifice. And, and that's, uh, I don't believe in whatsoever in animal sacrifices or anything like that. I'm not saying that, that the use of blood is, or even human, but I do believe it from on a personal level, like to give a little bit of your energy is something uh, really holds a lot of meaning and power in the intent that's put into the piece, the art, the, the piece of art. So it does work as a sigilization for me, uh, a projection of my, of uh, possibly, you know, the, of what, a sacrifice of part of the ego, you know, a little bit of the, the, the let part of your ego die, and uh, that's as far as I can really get into that without sounding too, without just taking people on too much of a confusing trip. So. Obviously, that's that's quite a personal piece. Extremely, yeah, you yeah. You've also been commissioned to do work for. Like specific work for other other people? Oh yes, all the time. Yeah, uh, it's kind of it's been kind of crazy. I, I'm getting commissions um, lately is just nonstop. Um, I've even had to put people on waiting lists, and uh, and I hate to even to say that because I know there's a lot of artists out there just trying to get commissions, <laughs> and and, uh, and I always if I can't do some work, I will. Always suggest some of my uh, my fellow artists to other people because sometimes the project may not inter interest me or, or uh, I just don't have the time. Um, but I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, I think it's the visibility it has a lot to do with it because when you become very a very visible artist and especially in publications, a lot of people authors for example will see other books and they'll see the style and they like it and you'll be contacted by several more authors that want their book to look the same and it's likewise with bands and I have an ability I, I can I can reproduce certain aesthetics that people want to have I think I have a good understanding of like some very old forms of uh, of uh, engravings uh, uh, Doré and and, and such those those old engravings are a big part of my my artistic identity um, so uh, to understand how to reproduce something that looks old but that's not old but still has a contemporary feel to it but it, it has kind of an atmosphere that seems old and I think people like that and that's something especially in the occult genre the the, the the books and such, people want a very 
arcane feel the same thing. They want something very old. They want something that feels like a, it's got a lot of meaning and intent put into it. So uh, um, that's something I'm thankful for, and I think that's something that's given me visibility, just that ability. And it's and uh, likewise also with the bands. Uh, um, a lot of the bands I deal with naturally are usually of the black metal persuasion. Um, rarely do I work with a band that's not really in some way associated either with the occult or black metal or uh, maybe gothic and death metal. Did you become known in the music scene first? Um, yeah, in yeah, scene? yeah. It was, it was mostly through the music. Um, uh, yeah, I did like some cover art, like for Coven, it was like a very influential American occult rock band from the 60s, and anybody who follows like occult rock, or they, they know who Coven is. And a few months later, I began working with Wolfpack 44 uh, with Richter Ravensbrook that's uh, from Electric Hellfire Club. Um, and he's actually become a very good friend of mine. And uh, But he reached out to me needing cover art, and their album's gonna be coming out within the year. Um, and uh, that's some very I've done some very intricate beautiful artwork for them uh, for their single releases and t-shirts and he's been one of my my favorite clients to work with because he's he pretty much gives me free reign as a and he, he, he treats me like I'm a member of the band so <laughs> it's like uh, he, he gives me a lot of freedom and you know some bands are, they want a very specific thing they want something that they want to have a very a lot of control over what's represented and what represents them and I totally respect that and I understand that but it's also great fun to, to have the freedom to, to feel like you're actually a part of the project and you're giving, you're giving your own interpretation so and, and actually on that point I, I rarely have to redo anything for people usually the first thing I come up with um, represents the the ideas they want to to, to convey pretty well um, I pay close attention to to what they tell me and and the music itself and the music that they write and I'm a fan usually of every band that I work with so and there's a lot of work I've done that's yet to be released so that's it, uh, it's, within the next few months and some bands that uh, I'm, I was a fan of prior to even working with them. So it's really great, you know, when you you, you find yourself uh, in a position like that and, you, and you're not seeing, you're, you're seeing your work being received very well by people that, that you admire, you know, it makes you, it, it gives you a lot of bit of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, it kind of justifies, your, you feel, Valid, validated, and uh, and uh, it's kind. It was kind of scary, you know, to, to say I'm going to start my own business, and, and I don't know if I'm going to be successful. There's so many artists out there doing what I do, doing the same thing. There's a lot of competition, obviously, and so I feel very, very lucky that that I was able to 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 have the time and the opportunity, and to have this 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 space to explore this kind of inner world of mine and, and kind of flesh it out and bring it into like a a bit of a reality and uh, I think it's kind of immersive now I'm trying to create a very immersive experience with everything visually and musically you know so um, I try to do the same thing for all for the clients as well for the bands I just want to uh, that's something that I've tried to achieve with Wolfpack 44 is to create an immersive experience with their music also visually to, to bring the, the sounds uh, to life. You know, I think it's important that the song, the, that, that songs are represented visually. It's maybe growing up, when I grew up in the 80s, 70s and 80s, uh, it was a ritual to sit down with an album, and, and especially vinyl, and, and stare at the, the gatefold album art. Like my... Uh, like a clearest memory is like with the Iron Maiden albums, like listening to the, the vinyl and staring at the artwork, the Derek Riggs artwork for, for hours. And uh, that was just the greatest happiness. It was a true ritual for me um, because of 
the act of going through the same motions every time and and uh, it really created like a, a space for me uh, like a kind of a sacred space and we kind of lost that um, association with music with the digital thing the digital media and uh, so what I've kind of wanted to do is kind of in a digital way kind of recreate that experience again and and that's what many artists that I'm influenced by these days are also trying to do as well. There's, God, there's so much beautiful art. I mean, that these these artists are creating. A lot of these artists, like like myself, they work in the occult field and publishing occult publishing field as well as the music field. So it's kind of a weird hybrid, and there's a weird connection between the two. And because the fans of the music are likewise fans of the publishers. Um, I have a good, very good relationship with Nephilim Press, which is who I, I've done several of their book covers and uh, continuing. I still have projects coming up with them for the next year and have a very close relationship with them. And it's been very rewarding working with them. But I noticed that, uh, like you can see on Facebook, who likes what? And I see the fans who follow the music will also always be following the publishers at the same time. It's kind of interesting. It's it's a there's a lot of knowledge and and it's like I see like a very unique little kind of niche in our genre of music that, of people that truly appreciate art and and appreciate a I'm trying. We're creating kind of our own little culture in a way uh, by reviving. Um, the past in certain ways and embracing the past and uh, exploring very complex ideas. I mean, some extremely complex ideas um, that you would not normally associate with typical metalheads or heavy metal genres. And, you know, so we're, I'm very, very proud to be part of that. Could you talk about your logo and uh, what Noah's uh, means? Well, um, Norot, the word's been with me since the 90s in my head. <laughs> it was just kind of wor a word. Sometimes you're just given words, I think, you know, like secret words that stay secret to you for a time. And, and they're, they're, they're words with intent behind them, but you don't really know the intent and the purpose of that word yet. And it's like an initiation. You go through personal initiations throughout your life, and that word all will always that word stays in your subconscious, and you don't know what it means, what it represents. And uh, over years, that word started to represent like a subconscious place, uh, my personal space uh, that I always wanted to illustrate the world. I always wanted to uh, to kind of give life to, and. Um, musically and visually and, and eventually one day possibly uh, in like film um, and uh, the word the word just I guess it just just represents my subconscious uh, the gateway in the subconscious to a broader world uh, the gateway in the subconscious to the higher self the gate you know it's it's it could be a, an alter ego of mine it could be like the name I gave I give myself after you know you know it's like you think of the metaphor of the of ego death the death of the ego um, you know I had some experiences uh, shamanistic experiences you know where I experienced an ego death a true ego death you know and sometimes you have to find a new identity and rebuild your ego and that's kind of a similar process I've gone through with this and it's like a process of initiation and a self-realization um, so the, 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 I couldn't think of a name better that suited the project and uh, because of those personal associations with the, with the word and it, I felt very vulnerable at first to, to come out with that word and uh, and not knowing if people would think, oh, is that your name, or what does that mean? And it's like it doesn't have any real meaning, I guess. And, and But personally, you can look at writers like Tolkien. I mean, he, he used words all the time that had root words in other languages, and Anglo-Saxon and, and old 
old English and he would create words using root words and I think maybe subconsciously I used maybe uh, maybe I was influenced with uh, root words uh, that's all I can say it, it's uh, as far as the symbol the symbol is based obviously you know on the, the heptagram like the a thalamic symbol um, that's important to me uh, a thalema and Crowley's philosophies, his his ideas are a huge influence on me. I don't define myself as a thelemite. I'm not a, a member of any official uh, OTO lodge, and and I've been in contact, but I just never never felt I'm not much for groups, and I'm more of a solitary practitioner of things. And he's obviously been a huge influence. And I have to acknowledge that. And uh, so, um, and also I'm using the serpents. The serpents are a huge part of the concept because they, they symbolize personal knowledge, self-knowledge. And that can go on forever talking about the, the use of the serpent in my artwork because you rarely will see any piece that I've ever done without a serpent. Um, and for some reason that that's something uh, that's always always forefront in my in my consciousness you during meditation i'm always seeing them I, I i i don't know i don't know i don't know what my fixation is with symbolism uh it's possibly a relation to the the um the seraphim uh, and uh, the fiery serpent uh associations going back to like pre-christian times and uh occult ideas uh associated with the serpent and, and serpent worship and uh, the Book of Enoch and a lot of that, that Enochian symbolism is a huge influence as well so I wanted to incorporate that into the logo as well so the logo has uh, is kind of a feel to me a very something from the time of the Nephilim kind of and also there's maybe some Masonic symbolism of course <laughs> maybe I know there's a huge I mean, is it, as I said, it will take forever to yeah, yeah, talk yeah. about the, the circle, but for, for people who might not know, um, you know, it's someone who may not be familiar with esoteric artwork or uh, occult publishing and so on, um, if you could just say something about the serpent uh, and its meaning in indigenous cultures. Yeah. Rather than the, the dominant meaning. Yeah, well, we, what we think is, is the serpent is the devil, and we associate it with the, you know, the Garden of Eden, and the devil's the bad guy, and the serpent's associated with the bad guy then, you know. and uh, But pre-Christian times, the serpent was revered um, as, you know, it was associated with the gods, the good gods. It definitely has a, a feminine current to me, a feminine energy, and it's obviously related to like you know you have Tiamat the dragon uh, chaos dragons and uh, there's not much differentiation I, I believe in, in ancient cultures between the serpent and dragons um, I think uh, sometimes when they're referred to it's possibly in, in different translations the word words have been substituted so serpent could have also meant dragon vice versa um because you see in Asian cultures predominantly dragons being very dominant, but then also in, 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 in whales and in places you see like that symbolism of the dragon, obviously, and it's everywhere in the world. And obviously... And in medieval times, yeah, like worm. Yeah, yeah worm. Yeah. Yeah. Then you, yeah, and then you have like the Mayan and, and in South America and the... the Indigenous and also Native American symbolism of the the, the serpents and uh, especially in the Mayan, of course, you know everybody knows about the the fly, the winged snakes and, and the association with their high, the high god. Uh, that's with the. I'm not extremely knowledgeable on that, so I don't want to go and try to act like I know everything about that yeah 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 and when i get back to columbia uh, I, I really want to explore more of the symbolism of the serpent within their um, indigenous uh, cultures there and to, 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 to 
it's it's very beautiful to me because obviously we, we associate that serpent with something very bad because of the Garden of Eden uh, situation and the woman obviously being catching the the crap end of the stick on that and, but the, the serpent uh, to me uh, represented uh, the knowledge and was gave that knowledge to a woman which obviously is a threat to a patriarchal society so uh, and there's also obviously a, some sexual symbolism between the serpent and the woman I guess also and there's a, a kundalini connection with the serpent and you have the uh, in the Kabbalah, the serpents are, are are very important, especially with the Tree of Life and and the Deuces. yeah Either. yeah and you know the, those those serpents have always been with us and I think they're in our subconscious mm-hmm. and they're associated with the uh, wisdom always though but also I think it, it's it's an animal that's very independent it's an animal that's that's that embodies. Uh, um, Individuality, I guess. You never see really serpents. They're not herd animals. <laughs> so, you know. Transformation. Yeah, transformation. Uh, yeah, that's a symbol. Of, like the chrysalis, also with the, a worm association with the worm and the moth. Uh, and that's a. And you know, and if you look at like even like going back to the the seraphim and the symbolism of the fiery serpents associated with angels. You know, before Christian times, the angels were. I believe they're the old gods, uh, and uh, the serpents were always associated with this with this order of angels, the seraphim, especially in the in the, um, the Kabbalistic sources. And uh, those those creatures, uh, these seraphim, or they called the fiery serpents, and they usually were the. Uh, I think they they seem pretty terrifying from the descriptions, you know. So I tried to I tried to illustrate that. Um, Could you talk about the project um, on Smokeless Fire? Oh yeah, Smokeless Fire. That's one of my, my favorite projects so far. I've done for uh, Nephilim Press and my good friend, uh, the author S. Ben Cain. He he. Uh, that's another uh, person that's pretty much given me freedom to to express myself visually. Um, and that doesn't happen always, you know, between two with the between an author. Some authors are are very specific about what they want, and uh, but sometimes you know your interpretation just falls in line with what they see. Um, and some people don't always always have the ability to express visually what they what they what they want to someone. And I was just lucky that I, I spoke a symbolic language. That he that he related to and obviously resonated very strongly you know, symbolically with what he was trying to convey. The book is about the jinn. Uh, it's a very interesting concept to explore, and it's something that I'd never explored until I accepted the commission. And so then I immersed myself into that that folklore, uh, and ancient Persian th- uh, mythology, and I'm of course extremely influenced by Lovecraft. Uh, it's obvious when you see my work. I'm obsessed with Lovecraft, but this wasn't a great opportunity to kind of use that because a lot of his work is based in 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 some of that those archetypes, uh, ancient Sumerian archetypes, uh, ancient Sumerian gods, and and so forth. And so it was it was a good opportunity to tap into that like little. Uh, pool of knowledge that I already had and and uh, also went and researched like Persian art and, and uh, tried to incorporate as much to give a very Persian feel to it honestly and um, I didn't want it to look like something you would see uh, I wanted to be you see like some ancient Persian books you see some beautiful artwork and illustrations on them and uh, I wanted to kind of give the book that kind of look on the cover, uh, and uh, but using the the sigil or the, the the angles that 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 the author had had created, I just expanded those designs he had, uh, embellished them quite a bit, and uh, added my own touch to things. And uh, luckily, like I said, we spoke a similar language. Uh, 
symbolically and uh, it just took off from there and uh, that was almost a year ago that I began work on that so it's 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 come full circle and that book has been one of the uh, most successful books I believe for Nephilim Press and, uh, and it's and it's just a gorgeous book it's it turned I'm very happy with the results of it and the book itself uh, the writing is is great the book itself is beautiful to look at so it's I think it's definitely on its way to becoming a highly collectible piece uh, and there's only limited numbers usually made and also the, the author he has some uh, his own personal uh, limited editions that are made. I think he's done. He's sold out of all of them already. Though there's all there's been a huge amount of demand for this book. Um, so there's a lot of success with that, and and, and, uh, and there's more coming. So we have another project planned between between ourselves. So we'll see in the next year what happens with that. Um, you mentioned earlier about the. Creative process and initiations. Yeah. Um, and when you're commissioned to do a project, mm -hmm. do you just do research, or is that also a, like a, a personal spiritual journey? Um, it depends on the nature of the project. Uh, sometimes I get approached for a commission, and sometimes it's sometimes an album cover, and I have to just illustrate an idea behind the concept of the band's album. And usually that's the no more than just listening to the band's music and just understanding what they're trying to say. Um, but when it comes to the, uh, the the books and the publishing side, yeah, I definitely have to, to know what I'm doing. Uh, I guess they, to be very informed about what I'm going to visually represent. I don't want to represent something... Uh, in a way that's that's going to take it out of context or misappropriate anything. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, so uh, as far as initiation, like to see certain pieces of art's initiation, that's usually only uh, applies to my own personal work because I believe each each I do most of my work is done in cycles, um, and I and I associated I associate that work in a cycle. And I usually give it like an overall title. Like when I first moved here, um, I did a, a collection of work called the Luciferian Works, and obviously it's like a combination of of words. There, it's, anyone who knows anything with the occult will see the association of words. So, uh, just created my own title with that. And and uh, but that was the first project I, I created here in Ireland within a few months of moving here and it was just what was foremost in my subconscious at the time came out and at the time I was really obsessed with the, the tragedy of the fallen angels and, the, and the, the story of the watchers and, the, and possibly the love between the angels and the, hum, and the human wives that they took put yourself in a context of basically being a stranger in a strange land imagine these these beings and they they could have they felt real love and then they were obviously banished but the symbolism is there of a, of a I think a like a Greek tragedy <laughs> and uh, I wanted to show that relation between the, the, the one primary fallen angel um, reaching down to the woman you know who's obviously there's a separation between them and a longing and a so I wanted to illustrate that, and then it was like very mushy and soft. Yeah. And if they can interact or mate, then they're they're not all that different. Right. So possibly it's you know you're looking at, at ancient culturally uh, a record of a clash of two cultures, one that was far more advanced than the other, and when they arrived, they thought there was the return of of their gods. Uh, so, you know. Who's to say, you know, things and ideas that we interpret now, ages ago, the situation was greatly different. But, you know, to the ancient mind that was very mythic and symbolic, these ideas stuck. And uh, it could have been as simple as that. <laughs> you know, no angels falling from heaven, no aliens from out of space, but simple 
an encounter between two cultures, one vastly different, possibly hunter-gatherers and agricultural cultures clashing, one that was more uh, civilization, because the Watchers claim to teach men agriculture, all these things, but possibly that could have been a hunter-gatherer type culture encountering a civilization. And you know, and who knows in what they call pre-flood times, before pre-catastrophe times, whatever. What? How? How far humans came? You know, until we, just like we're doing now, we're just going to destroy ourselves again. We could have repeated this cycle over and over, and we'll never know it because uh, the records are gone. You know, but living in a place like Ireland, of course, I'm. I can go any. I can go to the countryside here and, and see monuments that I know that were not built by modern man. They've been here longer than than we even know, and you can just feel something in those places that that that, that resonate with a culture and a time that have nothing to do with who we are now and what we think we know. You know so I believe it's a connection between that. You know. So uh, there's. I believe there's a connection between places and sites here you know to that time you know so uh, I, I was just trying to explore that so there there's references to that as well in the Luciferian piece so. does the place that you're living in uh, affect your artwork uh, definitely yeah obviously in style or in the process um, okay. both everything everywhere I'll live of course the process the environment I work in affects me and, um, and even the time of day I work affects me. And, and like I, uh, certain types of work I, I need to do during sunlight hours, during the daylight hours. Certain types of work I prefer to do at night. It just depends on the piece and the nature of the piece. And some, some more darker work I, I recently, the last cycle I did, I called the Maelstrom cycle. And that's like a piece of Lovecraftian inspired art. And uh, all those pieces were created in the middle of the night, nothing during the day. It was, it was important to, to, to sit in, 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 in these lonely hours, you know, and in, in dark, especially in some of the, the, uh, the summer months here, the, the night is so short. And, uh, and, uh, so I would just seize those times, you know, just to, to and work the whole night through. And but as soon as the sun comes up, you know, I kind of lose the energy. I lose the atmosphere. I lose the, the relation to it. But the Luciferian piece, on the other hand, was all done during sailor, sunlight hours. You know, it's like it's got more of a, a lightness to it, more of a, a definitely a light. It's more positive, whereas the Maelstrom stuff is very dark uh, I don't want to really say negative but it's it's an abyss it's the whole theme of it is the abyss and and the subconscious and uh, and the serpent that dwells within the subconscious you know that, that uh, to cross that abyss you know and, and I, it's that was the theme within that those works and and so let's see. I I do a lot of miscellaneous pieces that aren't really associated with any certain cycle, and those I don't really care when I work on those. It, it, there there there's obviously certain pieces that I that are are rituals to work on, and they have to be done at certain times. Even lunar cycles, uh, obviously they they affect what I do and how I do it. Um, full moons are not good times for me to work. Um, it's just I can't stand the full moons for me like I don't know what it is about it but I can't focus uh, uh, it's mostly new moons and waning moons as I focus best I don't know what it is My body, it's something subconsciously I don't think it's anything that affects me physically I don't believe the moon necessarily has a physical effect on me I think it's more of a subconscious thing uh, I, I, I'm always stressing the, the importance of the subconscious and like I'm, I'm influenced by Jungian psychology all, a lot and I believe in magical thought the influence of the of archetypes obviously and and uh, I'm not necessarily a literalist you know when it comes to like magical thoughts and uh, uh, 
ideology of any kind. I, I'm not really a like a fundamental occultist, I guess. I don't really uh, like go out in the woods and believe I'm going to be able to touch the gods or speak with the gods or pray to the gods. I I believe in a very more abstract idea, you know. And I'm obviously influenced by the left hand path more. Um, I don't believe in the left hand path is the typical negative connotations to the left hand path. That's the, the path of more burden. That's the path of true initiation. So, you know, to me, that's, it's important to maintain those, those ideas in my work and my life. You know, so, I, I obviously, my work's a lot of times associated definitely with the left-hand path, and I, I embrace that. Um, it's part of who I am, um, um, but I'm, I wouldn't necessarily call it satanic. In the old traditional sense of like Satanism, it's because I'm not an atheist uh, and uh, I'm a very spiritual person, you know. So uh, it's extremely complex, and you can't really explain that to somebody in, in just a sentence uh, or to say you're a member of a church or a member of an organization. I, I just I've rejected all that, you know, and being parts of things and, and ideas otherwise that don't express my personal ideas wholly and truly you know so I have my personal religion my personal beliefs and that's why I was mentioning earlier I don't really have any desire to be part of any like o the OTO or anything it's like uh, uh, I just I I, I'm, I prefer to just have my personal experience my personal initiations you have explained that the left hand path isn't necessarily negative no the psychological, yeah. the young, yeah. exploration yeah. of the, the shadow self and archetypes. Exactly. But are there places you wouldn't go or concepts that you wouldn't feel comfortable um, dealing with? Possibly. I mean, there are certain things that are, like, sadly, you know, in the occult world, you come across a lot of ideas that you don't relate to. I mean, there's still people that primarily the thing that I'm opposed to is any kind of animal abuse. And I'm an extremely I'm extremely misanthropic when it comes to humans, um, so I'm always going to be very passionate about the animal side of things and animal rights. Um, so that's the only thing that I, I will not work with someone if they if they are uh, condoning or making references to anything of that sort. No. Uh, I use animal bones in my artwork, but they're all found animal bones, and I have to make that very clear. That, you know, none of the animal parts or bones that I've used were ever from an animal I've killed or anything of that sort. It's always found, like the 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 skull, the goat skull that I gave to you uh, was an art piece I did. That skull, like I was telling you, was found in the mountains. You know, so way in the mountains is just. The poor creature just gave up the ghost and found his bones, and so I decided, well, I'll give him another life. What was left of him, just give it a, another life, you know. So on that that particular goat skull, I painted the Azazel Asa sigil because uh, it's important to to associate that uh, um, with that, and uh, it was a, it's a nice little piece. In a, it wasn't for sale or anything. I just did it just as a one-off little piece to see and. And uh, I'll recreate it one day, um, I'm sure. But I don't like to sell those types of pieces. Uh, I'll sell I'll sell artwork, but not not really those. I don't really I don't even want to take the chance of trying to ship bones <laughs> overseas and, and such. So cause I don't want to risk taking someone's money and then the thing being confiscated <laughs> for any weird reason. Do you uh, ever? worry about immersing yourself in um, a project that involves these darker energies? Uh, yeah, it, sometimes I can, it, it, it will drag me into the abyss too far, and uh, it affects me emotionally. Um, I, I first noticed my sensitivity to this uh, in the 90s. I first started doing uh, ritual work uh, early 90s and 
of course, initially I started out with your typical uh, beginners buckland and mall occultism. You know, I didn't really uh, feel much connection to them. So I, I just started kind of exploring my own and kind of writing my own rituals. And uh, but I noticed myself tending to drift towards the darker sides of things not darker as an evil but like a maybe it was like a consequence of my depression uh, throughout the years that's something I've struggled with all my life and, uh, so possibly possibly that always kind of being more pessimistic and drifting towards the darker sides of things And but I started finding a real beauty and comfort in the darker side of things and uh and uh, I actually, for 12 years of my life, I, I, the school I went to my whole life, and basically the type of environment I was raised around was Southern Baptist and Independent Baptist, an extremely fundamentalist background. Um, so I pretty much had the entire King James Bible memorized by the age of 13, pretty much by force. Um, every month we had to memorize 30, 40 verses or so. And if we didn't do it, they took us and beat us with a paddle on the ass, you know. And uh, damn near abuse. And uh, it started, of course, I started associating myself naturally with the darker side of things just because I felt rejected by these types of people that at that age, at an influential age, they represent a power structure, and a, an ideology that you feel like you're a part of. And then when you, these people almost to you at that fragile age, they represent God in a sense, or that God's perspective on you. And you think you're a good person and you're doing something good. And they turn around and treat you like you're, you're, you're the worst human ever just because you didn't memorize a, a few verses of scripture. And not, you're not even understanding what those verses mean by forcing yourself to memorize them. You're just, you're just memorizing just so you don't get a, a paddling. And so, you know, that was always a source of inspiration for me. I think always taking that as fuel that always kind of pushed me to the darker side of things. And naturally, it's no stretch of the imagination to 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 think that that I became associated with Satanism and things like that from an early age because of that those experiences. I think that was an important uh, what you call it, like cleansing for me um, in a way to like kind of uh, take back something you know for myself and uh, and yeah, I still struggle with that. Yeah, you know, uh, it's still like a source of anger for me. Um, it always will be, uh, and, and uh, I, I, I just I try not to dwell on it too much. But there are certain days, yeah, that, that especially in the music I do, and, and things that certain things manifest that I don't even know they're going to manifest, and uh, I can go way down into the underworld of my own personal underworld sometimes, and it's very hard to come back. Um, and uh, it, it's in, so it's important to maintain a balance, um, especially with the subjects that I work with and the archetypes I work with. Um, like recently, before the, I did this maelstrom cycle, which was Lovecrafty and in nature, I can always distance myself from that because I can always step back and say Lovecraft was fictional and based possibly, in, yeah, in real like um, mythology and real archetypes. But in the essence, the characters and the situations in his stories are fiction. But like when I start delving into like subject matters that are more uh, dealing with demons and angels, for lack of a better word, it sounds so cheesy to say it like that. But that's the dangerous ground for me sometimes um, because it has a personal relationship to my experiences as a child, I guess. And I guess it's similar experiences. Maybe I, I've always related to Crowley because he kind of had a similar experiences when he was young. And that's kind of what influenced, I believe, him, him, you know, and, and us, you know, and we, in this love for this embellished form of writing that even Lovecraft loved, it was like this 
King James Bible form of writing, you know, and it, and it kind of creates within itself when you when you read those types of words it kind of you I, I started seeing that type of language and use of words creeping into my own personal rituals you know so i decided just to to go with it and let it be a part of me and then by kind of making peace with it and accepting that i have my beliefs that are very old and pagan in origin but I also have my beliefs that are kind of like i guess my own personal mythology you know so um, I have to learn how to maintain the balance of not going into my own personal mythology too deep. Because <laughs> you start to become even delusional, possibly, as an artist. You can become, it's like a method actor as well. You know, you can become so immersed in a character or a subject, and it can take you over, and you can become that. And uh, you can let it uh, destroy you if you want. It's like a drug. You know, it's about controlling it and, 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 and moderation. So it's important for me to, to take a step back and just watch uh, ridiculous YouTube videos or something. If I feel myself getting too deep into this, it's time to, to, to go put myself into something totally unrelated. You know. um, can you talk me through the musical component of okay. the yeah. project? Yeah. Uh, when I moved here, um, the original intention was to record an album while I was here. Um, so I went and invested in some uh, recording uh, recording gear uh, and, and things when I got here. And, and it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I got the I got the time to do this. And then the more commissions started coming in, and I, I, I and the money was more important than my own personal projects. And also, as I was working on commissions, I'm working on my own artistic, my visual art. And I just became immersed in that and totally forgot about the music. Uh, <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I need to, 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 to write some stuff. So I began writing. And I noticed the songs, the cycle of the songs I was writing were always related to the piece of artwork I was working on at the time. They, they always seemed to, like... Uh, I guess reflect the mood and atmosphere in the artwork. And I started saying, you know, I really, I, I, when I look at this piece I'm doing, I hear a sound. And this color or this, this is the way this texture looks, I, it gives me a sound. And I, I, see, I, I see the world, like some people, I guess they say you can taste colors, you know, but I can hear pictures, I guess, is the only way I can say it. I, when I when I see something, it creates a sound and a vibration, and I believe in the power of vibration and like in magical thought. That's very important. The sound of vibration um, and how it is linked with creation and destruction. And synesthesia. Yeah. Notes have a musical notes have a color. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, so uh, so uh, I need to find the where these 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 pieces I'm creating where how they resonate sonically and I want to do that so I spent about two years the two years of the time here writing these pieces and this is a collection of guitar riffs hastily written lyrics and that always change when I actually record them but the concept was established the riffs were all there it was just about putting them together and so <laughs> The, the visual art was so dominant that the, the, the music was like, okay, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. And coming up on the last few months here, I realized uh, I haven't recorded anything, and that was part of this whole three-year cycle in it of, like a, a, of like a rebirth. It's like an initiation. To me, it was like a descent in, into, um, into the underworld and to come back up again and I need to when I come back out of the underworld I need to come out with 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 my prizes that, that, you know that I go and reclaim so uh, and it's to reclaim a part of myself musically because back in Louisiana when I was living there I recorded an entire album of material um, in the middle of lots of personal tragedies uh, that were happening simultaneously, um, uh, you know, like a lot of, of chaotic upheaval in my life throughout between 2005 all the way till 
until 2010 or so. Um, it, chaos in the worst sense, you know, not like a chaos that's like conceptual chaos, but like like a true, like your life is completely out of control. Um, that album was completely recorded and finished, and I never released it. And I just couldn't do it. I just, it's something when I listen to the songs, they make me nauseous now. Uh, I just relate them to, to that stuff. So it was kind of like a tragedy for me to just give up on it. And to give it, and I was really kind of down on never recording music again, and, and much less performing it. So, uh, uh, but when I got here, I felt different again, and decided like it's important for me to go and reclaim it, and to find it again, to go down into that place, and to 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 uh, just like a try, just to to burn all the fat off it, you know, just this and. Uh, to find the parts of it that were good and just and what I don't use I'll just just blow just throw it into the wind you know and let you know, just so um, basically <laughs> rescued a few things from those old songs but for the most part it was an all, all entirely new new concept and um, so over the past two months I recorded all of it <laughs> and uh, um, nine songs um and it's going to be on. It's going to be released today. Uh, with as soon as we're done with this interview, I'm just going to go ahead and release it. Uh, but it's just. It's right now. It's only for download. It's going nine songs. Uh, we have plans to release it through a label, possibly, and I have plans to release it on vinyl with all the artwork as a primary focus. Because each song has an, an individual piece of artwork associated with each song. So. It's it's more than just a musical concept. It's an art concept, and I'd like it'd be nice to do like an exhibition one day, you know, with all of it represented together. Um, but the, the the songs are just as diverse as the art. Um, There's some songs that are straight up pure black metal, old. Not I wouldn't say old school black metal, but uh, more experimental in nature. And there's some ambient, atmospheric work, and then then there's some songs that are straight up fields of the Nephilim ripoff. And the, the nine songs have a, an overarching. Kind yeah, of yeah, they have a theme. Uh, obviously, the serpent. The name of the album is going to be Nothrock, Old Gaelic for sa- uh, serpent or snake. I like the sound of Nothrock. Uh, the way it sounds, it just sounds very strong. And it kind of goes with the concept of Norot, I believe, because it almost sounds like the words relate to each other. I don't know. And uh, the, a lot of the songs, yeah, deal with, like, the very first song is called Light Bearer. It's obviously a relationship with the fiery serpents and, and, and the seraphim and, and so forth. But also there's a theme about the, the feminine forces, or like chaos in nature and the dragon and, and the serpent. Um and uh, the world of men coming to an end in the end of the patriarchal age uh, and it's and it also some lots of references to the abyss to the subconscious the exploration of those things um, actually I was I'm hugely influenced by Jim Morrison like fun it, like it's like some people say oh Jesus here we go with this but no, but really he was influenced obviously by William Blake and uh, Joseph Campbell and, uh, and Jungian ideas. Obviously in the, the man himself, like he was immersed in his subconscious constantly and, and from a shamanistic sense. And uh, I've, I've lived part of my life in that way <laughs> for a few years and really explored the subconscious in a, I guess an anthrogenic or shamanistic sense uh, the old using like uh, medicine I guess to not really use the word psychedelics but a lot of my work was early on a lot of these ideas I, ha- I have were I seen years ago through certain I guess uh, little path workings I did with in psychedelic experiences, and I'm not ashamed to say that uh, I'm not a drug user. I, but 
but psychedelics are not drugs to me. Those are sacraments. Uh, and they showed me a lot. And Many are to see Zen teachings. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Exactly. Time. So I owe a lot to those things, uh, actually, honestly. I don't use them anymore. It's just I haven't needed them. It's something that, like, it's if if I'm at that crossroads sometimes, I, yeah, it's something that you will have to do. But um, I've chose to live my life in that way, you know, and it, it might have consequences. And you learn your way, and you feel your way through those experiences, and you learn what's right for you, and and how to to control yourself, and how to live um, productively, and not. It's like everything else. You can fall too deep into that pit, and, and we all have that in us to do that. And that's our personal, uh, our own personal uh, darkness that we can we can either we can go into it and find the light that we have, our own personal light, and uh, or we can just choose to just truly let it be what it is, the Tartarus of our subconscious, and be like in prison ourselves in our own hell you know so I've chosen to go find those things and bring them out to the light you've talked so. about Norot as a as a place uh, you made me think of William Burroughs and his own as a place yeah. where a writer goes yeah know? yeah you, you've mentioned a few times about going and bringing something back yeah yeah so would you say that that's the cycle yeah yeah I, it's a constant cycle it's like the same cycle you've seen uh it's reflected in, in the descent of the moon and the descent of the sun and the rebirth, uh, you know, of Osiris going to the underworld, resurrected, coming back, the, and then Horus and, you know, a lot of Thelemic symbolism, but also in Sumeria you have, like, the descent of the, the goddess of Nana into the underworld, and she comes back. You know, it's... And, and why is the, the underworld is always such a a big, big part of initiation is such a big part of, I mean, even, even like when I, when I go to like passage tombs, uh, here in Ireland, just like, I feel like I'm descending into the underworld and I could see the ritual importance of that, especially I, I went to New Grange recently and other than the massive amounts of people there, it's very hard to feel like some connection there. But I was lucky enough to, to go to another passage tomb close by where there was no one. And we had basically a freedom to move within the tomb. And it was an almost identical to New Grange. It just wasn't as big. But it, it had the same alignments. Um, I believe that was a little slightly different. I think this one was aligned to a different time of year. But um, I just can't remember off the top of my head the name. Um, I'm terrible with names. <laughs> but... Uh, it was just within a few kilometers. But anyway, I, I, I was able to spend enough time inside that tomb to really to feel like immersed in an underworld. And, uh, and, and, and then when you emerge from it, you, know, you really can get that sense of the, the womb symbolism and, the, and its relation to the abyss and the relationship to rebirth. And, and, uh, and also... Being close to the sea here has been a great source of inspiration. It's actually where I've drawn a lot of inspiration from. It's just the seas here have a different feel than they do in the Gulf of Mexico. And I remember uh, when Katrina happened and, and saw like that true power and force of nature. And, and, and the sea didn't even do these things. It was the hurricane, but it, the hurricane drew its power from the sea. You know, and it was, it was like I, I started relating that to this very primal Tiamat type image, like uh, archetype, and uh, going through Katrina, uh, and and then the Hurricane Rita right after it. That was where I was at. Rita was even worse than Katrina. It was an extremely like psychologically uh, like jarring experience, um, but also kind of it felt initiatory and cleansing, but painful because my life was in complete chaos at the same time that was unrelated to that but it was it was but it was that feeling of a complete loss of control <laughs> you know and so when I went to the sea here I saw like these these seas with a color I've never seen before so like an Anstown beach like where we had our 
hand fasting ceremony me and my wife that do help the Swiss and uh, that color of that water uh, that color actually inspired the Morigu drawing that I did um, I, this type of aqua greenish blue color I wanted to kind of put because that drawing kind of represents that energy of the primal force of that sea uh, it's 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 a different type of sea here you know it's it's very emotional sea it's very angry especially at Anstown that that water is the rocks we don't have that in Louisiana you don't see like mountains that just are cliffs that you can just overlook these massive uh, uh, angry waves and rocks and that really inspired uh, me with the maelstrom idea and the, the, the swirling water and then the, the this and I would just imagine myself um, falling into that water and just let myself fall and fall and fall and fall until it became black you know so. and symbolically you could connect the, the abyss and the, the primal waters exactly yeah exactly it was very obviously feminine symbolism there but a very dark not like not like this typical like uh, kind of neo-pagan kind of way of seeing a goddess that's very almost like how Christians see Jesus is a very soft everything is so light and happy and, and we forget that um, that nature and, and the cosmos in itself, you know, is constantly in a state of destruction and chaos and rebirth. And without that chaos and that destruction, nothing can ever truly come to pass, I think. And that's reflects an initiation. You know, these themes are constant in my work, the initiation, um, the death and rebirth. And it's the death of the ego, the rebirth of the ego. Every time the ego dies, you can recreate it and build it into something until I believe you get closer to your HGA, you know, your holy guardian angel, you know, your true higher self, who you really are. It's like you think you want things, you think you know who you are, um, but that's this very basic ego that you've had since you were born. And you need to you need to kill that thing and several times and let it be reborn again, and then you see it becoming something, and you see yourself becoming something that you didn't even know you were, and that's because you're getting closer to who you really are and what you really want. You think you want something, but you really don't want it. You know, it's like people think they want money, they think they want this, they want that, but your money's good, but <laughs> it's not gonna fix everything. You know, and. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to to go through those things and and not be afraid of death and and uh, at all. I mean, it's like that. There's far more things that are more that are that are that are scarier in the world to me than the act than the act of actually dying. Uh, I think it far more traumatic is is the death of of others <laughs> that you have to go through. Like, I'm not scared of my own death. I fear the death of others more. You know, I, I hate going through that. But but I think from going through personal deaths, little personal deaths through your life, you re you develop a relationship with death. And you, really, <laughs> you, you stop being scared of destruction and, and letting go of things. And it starts to become... Uh, very liberating to just be able to let something go and to just to give it back and, and so that's another thing that I try to use. On that note of the the abyss and death and transformation um, would you like to play the song Her Woven Abyss as a, as a closing yeah. piece? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> 